Uh, it has relevance and the bigger question and the deeper question and I suppose in many ways uh, the more important question is can the ANC survive the succession battle it's not all about uh, you know who will win whether it will be the Ramaphosa slate or the, or the Glamini Zuma slate or whether now it's, it's in Kise or whoever else uh, will Zuma still prove to be the ultimate tactician I think that's one side of it but uh, in terms of, of the long term uh, perspective is will the ANC as a ruling party survive and either way, whether you say yes or no, what would be the consequences, not only for the party, but uh, for the country? Those are things uh, and those are the discussions and, and uh, those are points that uh, you have to consider uh, whether you support the ruling party or not. And to unpack that for us, uh, we have uh, in studio this evening, Ibrahim Fakir. He's a well-known political analyst and he is the director of programs at uh, Asri, the think tank. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, Hafizab, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome once again to the program. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and shukran jazakallah for having me. Do you guys also get a bit tired about uh, discussing the, the same kind of issues almost day in and day out? Well, of course we do, but and you know, if we if we had all the answers, Molana, uh, we wouldn't be here, would I? I'd be I'd be taking you on a cruise on the Caribbean in my yacht. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, of course, Alhamdulillah, none of us can actually foresee the future as it as it would be. But we try and read the trends and we try and analyze what's actually going on. If I were to to commence by asking you that, uh, if you have to rewind in your own mind, six months or maybe twelve months, what were you thinking in terms of how this was going to play out? I mean, for a number of years, we knew that come uh, 2017, it's going to be a key moment, uh, you know, who will succeed Zuma. Uh, th there was speculation, there was analysis, six months out, 12 months out. How different is it compared to what you expected? You know, it's not that different because I'd like to situate it in two different streams. The first is we can go back further than just a year. We can go back a decade, uh, you know, in the lead up to 2007, in the big bruising contest between Jacob uh, Zuma at the time and the incumbent at that time, Thabo Mbeki. And the real difference between them uh, was not just about style. It was, in fact, as the Zuma side then put it, ideological. Why did they say so? They said so for four, deal, four reasons. One is they said Thabo Mbeki has presided over economic growth, but the economic growth has not been redistributionary. Mm -hmm. So it's been jobless growth and we haven't kept pace with the number of jobs which need to be created. Now, therein lies the first lie, because it is true that there was growth, but it is not untrue that there wasn't jobs created. There were jobs created. It may not have been enough, but there were jobs created. So that's the first issue. The second ideological question was his denialism around HIV AIDS uh, and interventions in the health sector. And there, there have been improvements under a Zuma government. So, you know, for those of us who have to watch this and to simply say nothing's happened under the Zuma watch is not entirely true. So on health, there was a turnaround. On the economy, of course, there wasn't. In fact, in the economy, there was a regress mm. uh, or, or stasis, as you would say. You know, things, things remain static. The third reason that the ideological fulcrum had broken down on was they'd believed that Thabo Mbeki had become too exclusionary in his policy making, that he'd surrounded himself with a coterie of people, he'd left out the ANC, and more importantly, he'd left out the alliance partners. So they felt sidelined and they weren't included. So that was their third complaint. Their fourth complaint was beyond the economy and beyond normal participation. They believed that the focus was too much on questions of black economic empowerment and empowering those who are already empowered, and there wasn't enough redistributionary impetus. And so they believed that Zuma would come in on a ticket which would be more friendly, uh, to being inclusive of everyone. It would be much more non-racial because they accused Mbeki of being quite an Africanist uh, and in part that accusation was true. Mm. Now if you think, if you cast your mind forward from then, from 2007 to now, you're actually also having ideological disagreements. Not that all the ideological issues that the Zuma side tabled in 2007 has come to pass, no, they haven't. But there are new ideological issues. The first is, the one side, the Nkosazana Lamini Zuma says, side says, 
transformation has not been fast enough. We've got to expropriate land without compensation. That's the first key thing. The second ideological difference between the two sides contesting is the role of the Reserve Bank. They say, change the mandate of the Reserve Bank. Uh, why they want to do it, you know, no one knows, mm. because there's, it's not going to suddenly be miraculously changing the economic trajectory. So that's the second thing they say. The third thing they say is give a full spectrum banking license to the post office and increase the number of banks which are, which are, which are licensed to operate as lenders uh, and in the capital markets. So, and, and primarily those must be black banks. And fourth, they say, let's have um, economic growth led by state procurement through the state-owned enterprises. Uh, so that means that they must only procure from black business, they must procure in the local economy, they must not import, etc. So those are the four things they stand on. And the other side, the Ramaphosa side, so to speak, says, no, the actual regulatory framework at the moment is sufficient. We simply need to strengthen that and strengthen government operations and we can improve that. Second, we must maintain the inclusivity of the constitution. Third is we must maintain the separation of powers and functions of the constitution, leave the Reserve Bank as it is, and we should have state-led growth through state-owned enterprises, but we must involve the private sector more. And of course, we will stimulate black industrialists. That's what they say. So there's ideological, there's ideological divisions. Now, if you ask me a year ago, would I th have thought that this would have happened? I think we saw it a year ago that the ideological differences are there. Mm. And that goes to the heart of your question. Can the ANC survive? If they survive now, they certainly will. But I don't think that this is going to be endless because there is, you know, if you have, if, if I paint the picture of such stark divisions on how they're thinking about how to go about doing things, but also more starkly, their very fundamental idea of what must the form of government be? Must you have a separation of powers? Must you concentrate or, or should you concentrate powers in the executive? You know, a, a president who can simply make decisions with his cabinet and go along without the checks and balances in parliament. Mm. So it's a fundamental difference in how you approach the idea of what society must look like and whether they can accommodate each other over over the next five years in given that they have such divergent thinking you know who knows unless of course you get a crop of ANC members and leaders who are convinced uh, of, of, of a political program which is not so far apart then they might succeed but if not I can't imagine that this would they would stay in the same house so to speak for the next five years in, in terms of these ideological divides which you have so uh, eloquently explained to us how many of those backing the respective camps, if I can pull it that, are doing it purely for ideological reasons and who are doing it because it's going to be expedient for their own political ambitions? There's always a mix between personal ambition, political ambition and sort of policy outlook. And some would think, well, if I back this ticket, uh, you know, I'm likely to get in. But I think, uh, Molana, that there is something more subtle and invisible going on uh, that we're beginning to pick up. So if you think of the one side, the Cyril Ramaphosa side, mm. for example, or Lindy Sulu, who's another contender, or Zwei Lim Kizi, the stakes for elevation into political office are quite high, but I don't think, and especially not the Ramaphosa camp, is not prepared to do anything and everything possible to achieve office. Uh, because it's a nice to have, it is something they will work hard at, but it is not a do or die situation for them. Whereas if you think about those on the other side, whoever Zuma decides to back, whether it's uh, Nkosa Zanad Lamini Zuma, and now you've of course introduced uh, the Mkizi option mm. <laughs> as a second. So whether he expediently chooses to, to, to back either one of those, for them it is a question of do or die. For him, his preferred successor and the deals he can strike with them about immunity from prosecution, about not prosecuting those people around him who are involved not just in state capture, because state capture is a bit of a misnomer, but people who have been involved in out and out corruption. Can he get some kind of deal to immunize them? And, and thirdly, can he strike a bargain with whoever is elected to benefit those who are around him uh, continuously in the private sphere, in, in the economy? So that's the three deals he wants to get, but it is literally for that side, do or die. They are prepared to do, and I would think, anything in order to be elected. Now, if we take that as the starting point, then the incentives for whether the conference at the end of the year should happen or not starts changing the equation. Because originally, we would have thought, and you asked me earlier, what would I have thought a year ago? A year ago, I would have thought, well, of course, everyone wants the conference at the end of December. In fact, until a week ago, 
I was of the view that I don't think it's in anyone's interest not to have the conference at the end of this year. But now you put the spin on this question and you say, uh, you know, whose personal ambitions uh, are being served or is it purely that they are seized by this ideological and political fervor that they genuinely believe in this? Well, that then takes you to the question of if they genuinely believe in this, surely they would want the conference to happen. Now, the one side believes, of course, the conference should happen because you don't want to give the other side the latitude to be able to organize uh, themselves and marshal their arguments and marshal mm. their resources. Uh, and so the other side doesn't want to think that those guys on the opposition should have that chance. So it's bo in both of their interests to do so. But they have some of these provincial congresses and there are court cases emerging from within the same organization, contesting each other in a province, not even mm. nationally yet. And so wh what do you pick up? You pick up that the incentive to be included at any cost, at all cost, is so high that you would be prepared to walk out of a conference you would be prepared to take your own organization and its members to court. Uh, you would be prepared to fight to the death if need be. And we've got 30 odd political murders just in the last two years, mm. all related to this. And you start to get the sense that actually for the one side, it looks like you know it's expedient to have the conference and to have it sooner rather than later. But the other side is making literally daily calculations. Are we in, are we out? Do we have the numbers? Are we gonna be able to carry the day? And if they answer no to either of those questions, then they believe that I think they believe that uh, it would be prudent if they collapse the conference or postpone it because they don't have the numbers. And both KwaZulu-Natal as well as the Eastern Cape are beginning to show that, you know, though the difference may not be that big between them, uh, the margins are small, but we are, we're not able to carry the conference. And if they believe they aren't able to do so, they will want to, they will want to postpone it. And so that should give you the answer for, whose personal interests are being served. Uh, not all of them are genuinely convinced that this is an appropriate political program, because if they did, what would stop the one side from combining with the EFF? Mm. Because clearly they say the same things, don't they? Yeah. Land expropriation, change the mandate of the Reserve Bank, uh, let's have state-led growth through st uh, procurement and, and, and entrepreneurship uh, through, 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 through state-owned enterprises, nationalize the mines, Nation give more banking licenses, national give, create a state bank. So there's no political difference between what si one side of the ANC says and what the EFF says. So if they were genuinely convinced about politically, why don't they combine? But they don't. And so therefore it's a mix between subtle political differences but genuinely really about personal ambitions and not just personal ambitions, but personal protection for some of the wrong things that people have been doing. So all this talk about uh, the, the, the unity uh, aspect on one hand and the tradition aspect on the other hand, so the Ramaphosa camp saying tradition is the deputy succeeds uh, the incumbent president. On the other hand, uh, the, the Zuma camp seeming to go for that unity ticket and in that comes the whole Inkize option. What do you make of it? Do, do you think that that was his plan B all along? Do you think it has now become his plan B? Uh, is it perhaps, uh, are we now starting to realize that maybe the fallout between him and Inkize uh, over Nene's firing was not all that big and that uh, Mkise has been uh, a Zuma man if you go by Riri Klabi's book and, and the revelations there about how Mkise tried to make the rape or allegedly tried to make the rape charges go away. Well, in my view, I think the safest option, the safest bet we can go with, uh, cognizant of course that betting is haram, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the safest bet is, is to bank on the fact that that Jacob Zuma is making daily calculations about how things are shifting. So it's a lot more expediency rather than strategic calculation from a year or two years ago, knowing, you know, so he didn't have the foresight to think that Zoelim Kizi would definitely be on his side and it's someone who can back. I think that he's been reading the signs in the provinces. He's been looking at the oppositions uh, in both court cases. He's been looking at the fact that you might have the specter of a third court case in the Northwest province or something from the Northern Cape. Those are the ones we know about. That gives you four provinces out of five, which are not completely stable. KZN, KwaZulu-Natal, we know, has not been stable for quite some time. The Western Cape has been perpetually unstable in the ANC for quite so. So now you, you factor those in, and you've got three pro coherent provinces which are going to the conference. And all of those three coherent provinces, not all of them back you. So what option do you have? Uh, it looks like the, the, one, the horse that you did back is not necessarily going to win. She can't carry the conference for you. 
So you've got to look for another option. And I think that option has just came, come about in the last few days. And that's how the calculation has happened. So, of course, he's a master tactician. But this is not the strategic chess game that he saw this move coming for a while. I think it's a daily expedient calculation. He saw the shift in the tide and has therefore shifted what we think has shifted his support. So now I think he's looking at two options um, in terms of who he can back. Uh, as opposed to the other side, which is only looking at one option, uh, and they're no longer looking at the Mkhizi option, which they might have looked at. So, so yeah, it's it's a, it's a daily calculation. Did Ramaphosa inadvertently hand the Mkhizi option to Zuma by not including Mkhizi on this supposed slate that seems to be floating around? Well, he might still. You know, who knows? He might include Ndiwe Sisulu because he might think that the gender option or the the option of gender parity is an important mm. one. So, so all these things are open. My, my, my honest appraisal, uh, which is what I've been trying to suggest to people, even investors who we might be speaking to, is to say, you know, if you think we know what lives in the minds of the 4,000 delegates or the three contenders or the five contenders if you want to expand the base, we don't. And no one does. You can read some of the trends, but let's give them the space to decide what they need to decide. Of course, they should do so appropriately within the confines of the movement, within the confines of their own rules, which is what they appear unable to do. Mm. And that's problematic. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we don't know, frankly. And, and we've got to be honest about it because you can't see the trend that clearly now. Uh, and this is, what, this is what democracy is about. It is about an element of uncertainty. You know, if we knew what the outcome was going to be, then why have a democratic contest? So I think it's important that we allow them the space to propose the ideas. You can shoot down the ideas if you like, uh, but let them, go, let them go ahead and contest it. But contest it on the basis of the rules that you yourself have commonly agreed to. And that's the problem now. I think the problem is the impunity with which people are abusing the rules with no consequence to it. Uh, so, so, you know, whichever option who decides to back, that is up to their conscience. But we as a community also have to be careful now. Because, you know, we often have this inkling and inclination to want to back a horse. Uh, of course, in a national election, we will all want to punt for a particular political party. Mm. In this race, we will want to punt for a particular individual because we might not only like the individual, but also like the policy stance. We've got to allow people to make this decision on the basis of their own conscience. We cannot afford, as a community, to say, here's a line of march, and this is what you must follow, because this is what will be good for us. Uh, nothing can be good for us except the freedom and the liberty and the dignity to allow people to make political choices as they wish to make. And the same would apply uh, in the way in which it goes in the ANC. So if there's a horse you're saying we should back, uh, I'm not sure. All right, time for a break. When we come back, we continue the discussion with Ibrahim Fakir. Welcome back. So this evening uh, with our guest, Ibrahim Fakir, he is a political analyst uh, and director of programs at ASRI. We're talking and uh, we're asking the question, can the ANC survive the succession battle? That's, that's the, the, the deeper question, I suppose, in many ways. And uh, we're going to get to, to unpacking that in a little bit more detail in, in a short while. But we've been an analyzing uh, the current situation and, you know, trying to understand the different developments. Uh, but as Ibrahim says, you can, you can never be 100% certain that it's, it's one way or the other. Uh, in, in some ways, I suppose it may be frustrating, but in other ways, it's so fascinating. It makes it uh, so interesting, uh, especially from, uh, from a media perspective and from an analytical perspective. The Inkosazan and Lamini Zuma campaign, I think uh, many have been, have been grappling with this question that why has it been so, I don't know if you want to call it lackluster or so dry, uh, boring if you like. Is it just uh, to do with her personality or was it overconfidence at the outset? Well, it might be a bit of both, uh, but I think there's a third aspect. And the third aspect is that, look, in reality, no one's offering anything new. Uh, these debates about about land expropriation without compensation has been put on the agenda by the ANC Youth League uh, when Malema was still within the Youth League, then the EFF. So it's not a new debate. The debate about uh, changing the mandate of a reserve bank has been happening around the world for quite some time. Uh, the debates about whether you need new banking operators and you need to break the monopoly of the big four, as they call them, has also been happening for a while. So there's nothing new she's offering. On the other side, they're also not 
offering anything new specifically, but they are saying something that resonates with most South Africans, which is that the constitutional settlement was appropriate, that the fact that you have effective separation of powers and good procurement rules for for working against the abuse of public resources is a good thing. So they're saying, you know, it's exciting because in the context of accusations of state capture, which I would call out-and-out -out corruption, not necessarily state capture, that does sound exciting because it harks back to the Helicon days in which the transition occurred, that you are constructing a new society, and they're saying let's take those rules and let's consolidate them for the development of society. The other one is pretending, you know, I'm throwing out new ideas, but in reality they're not. Mm. So I think that explains why I don't think it's that exciting because also, you know, it's a lot of rhetoric, it's a lot of rhetorical flourish and so I don't think that it's always been lackluster and unenergetic because in the communities where she has been speaking, uh, it's attracted a fair bit of attention and media attention also. So, you know, I think it's taken a bit of a damp squib over the last little while but in part, that's also because there are so many entrants to this political market this time round. I mean, they've never had uh, seven contenders at the last when count. When has been complaining about that? Uh, exactly. Now, you know, he must then decide whether he wants democracy and contestation. Uh, and if they don't want that, then they must just decide that they want a dictatorship inside the ANC. And then when they go to a public election, the public will decide what they like. Um, so so I don't think it's completely lacks luster. I just think it's they, they're not offering anything new. In part, you're right about her personality. Um, but in part, it's also got to do with the appetite that, the, that, that South Africans have. Because look, the reality is there will come a point where people will say, stuff your internal rules and your internal processes. There are two things going on here. One is you repeatedly keep showing us that you are not faithful to your own internal rules. Why should we trust you with anything further? Number one. Number two, frankly, we are tired of hearing, but what about this rule? What about that? Or you didn't do this? Or the credentials are being fought over? Or we didn't order the branches properly? Or you leaving us out of the conference but we should be there? Frankly, the public is tired of that. They saying, get your house in order, elect your leader, do what you have to do, if it's exciting, great. But we don't want it to be exciting for all the wrong reasons, which is what it is now. You know, so now the spectacle of people throwing chairs at each other, yeah. it becomes the issue. Uh, the spectacle of people taking each other to court becomes the issue. People hurling abuse and insults or delegitimizing the other side, or finding uh, insulting names to give each other, or singing insulting songs, that becomes the focus. So the public is going to frankly get tired of that sort out your internal rules and get ahead with it. So you've got two, two impetuses here which are saying, A, you can't appear to manage your own internal house and you can't keep it in order, firstly. And secondly, we're tired of hearing about your rules and what's inside your house. Just get on with it. Because the, 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 the thing then is become, you say you have an incentive for, to fight for something. And that something is to win power in 2019 come a national election. If you carry on in this way, you may likely be out of power and so you're fighting for nothing. Yeah. On, on the issue of uh, Glamini Zuma, do you think the media have also played a part in the sense that, for example, come Lindiwe Sisulu, they're hyping it a bit more because they see her as a better candidate, standing for, for better things as, as compared to her. Glamini Zuma being compromised because she's uh, basically uh, jumped in with the Zuma faction. In part, yes, but in part also because Lameni Zuma is not that charismatic. Mm. But, but, but the problem that our media fails to repeatedly do is they would always point to Nkosazana Lameni Zuma and surprisingly I'm going to come at, to her defense here, which is very rare, I, I hardly ever do. You know, when all the shenanigans happened inside the South African state, not necessarily the ANC, but the state, and the ANC was busy defending these things, Nkandla, the Sasa Grants crisis, the scandals, Klamini Zuma was not here, she was at the African Union. Mm. But Lindiwe Sisulu was. Yeah. So she's a much more charismatic candidate. You might in the media like what she's saying. But let's be frank and let's be honest for a moment. Let's also take a bit of introspection and say, but the reality is this woman was here and presided over much of this nonsense that has happened in the state. In fact, on some occasions in parliament, she was in the forefront of leading the defense in debates for Zuma. But those are not the questions they're asking, because you're right, they simply see her as a slightly better candidate, more charismatic, more, dare I say, in the age of social media and instant media, more aesthetically pleasing 
because she comes across, you know, mm. she's prettier, she's uh, slimmer, she has that look, um, and so and so and so you get caught by it. Uh, but but the real fundamental question is yes, and Kosazana Lamini Zuma might have problems. She had a lackluster period at the African Union, but she certainly wasn't here when all of the nonsense happened. Indi Sulu was. What would be the best? possible outcome for the ANC in terms of this elective conference. There, there are those who are talking about a kind of uh, unchallenged uh, slate, if you like, where the two major groupings come together and they say, okay, from a top six, we'll go to a top nine and try and accommodate all the major candidates from both sides. Do you think that's realistic? Well, Anna, you know, yes, it's tempting and it's seductive as a thought because it becomes more stable, it becomes more predictable on the one hand. But then I got to ask you the question, why would you go to an election then? Just make a consensus around a slate and, and go ahead with that leadership. Don't have an election. For me, the best outcome is they actually have a genuine contest within the rules of the ANC, within the constitution, that you don't pull fast ones as they did in KZN. And as the judge said, you call an early conference, you say your constitution says so, but it doesn't. It doesn't actually say so. It says so that you can call it if 30 branches call for a conference and a particular time period has lapsed. Otherwise, why would your constitution make provision for having elective conferences at specified periods? Mm. Uh, you know, uh, because then you're not electing, and the same logic would apply now. If you want a consensus slate, yes, of course you should have it, and you should have it unified, but that should come from the groundswell, from, from, from the bottom up. Your delegates must say that that's the case. You ought to give them the option of, of making that choice. Otherwise, it is not an election. It is not a contest. Then you may as well decide, as I said before, you want a particular dictatorship because you believe that brings stability, and then you must go ahead with that. But then you will risk a split. For the genuine Democrats who want real competition, they must walk out. But then, but then they should, as Makosi Kosa did. Now, I suppose the challenge, coming back to that key question, can the ANC survive the succession battle? Let's say they, they go, and you've got these two big uh, groupings uh, that will contest. If the one win, wins, hands down, the slate uh, kind of uh, prevails, there's that fear that the other may walk away. But on the other hand, if you get a mixed bag, there's the fear that they may just not get along for the next five years. Well, precisely, that's the thing. And, and, and what we've been trying to warn, warn about is that I think from now on in, the ANC it becomes an inherently unstable entity. And it's unstable not just because of the, of the cross-pollination of different people with different ideas trying to accommodate themselves in the same place, but you've got to look beyond the ANC and what surrounds the ANC. You have an SACP which seems coherent now, but may itself start to fracture, but it's also becoming smaller and marginal. And you've got a Congress of South African trade unions, uh, which is also fractured, right? So even though they had their strike and they spoke with one voice last week, we know that the reality is that the top leadership of the Kusatu is split. Two or three of them support one particular option individually, uh, and one or two support uh, Zuma but they've got to carry what the mandate says, and that is to support Ramaphosa. But that might fracture over time too. So inherently now, not just because of the ANC's own internal broad church politics, which is no longer serving it, it is also not serving its alliance partners, and its alliance partners are not serving them. So I think we are looking at a period of instability, actually. If there isn't a walkout, the ANC remains an inherently unstable entity, because not only is there a risk of the fight back, uh, if there's a clear winner-loser situation, a zero-sum game mm. where those who are left out feel bitter, they will work with against the other. They will work against the other portion in the state and elsewhere. We spoke about Lamini Zuma. What, what do you make of Ramaphosa? There, there, there seems to be many who feel that uh, he, he's surprised in terms of what he's achieved in especially the last six months, and they felt that uh, he's played a smart game up to this point. Well, I think he's played a smart game because I think he's played a more genuine and slightly more authentic game. Uh, he hasn't worried too much about the strategy. But that goes back to the point that I was making, that I think the incentive for him to be elected is high, but it's not a no-holds-barred, do-or-die death situation. Mm. So I think he's been prepared to do it in a more genuine and a more honest way. Now, of course, a lot of mud has been thrown his way and will be thrown. I, I wouldn't be surprised in the next two months, and I think 10 weeks, we're away 10 weeks from the conference, or 12 weeks that you will not find more dirt dished up on candidates put out in the media, salacious, accusatory, 
uh, vicious, uh, labeling, uh, insulting uh, st stories, some of which might be true, some of which might be manufactured. But bear in mind that in the lead up to the 2012 conference of the ANC, Ramaphosa was chosen as a deputy on the back of Marikana. Mm. So no matter how much is thrown at him, it appears as if he's going to be resilient. Uh, and he's got a fairly coherent campaign around him. I think what he's saying is exciting and is, is animating people because I think they're taking a short-term view. The short-term view is you must have more investment in the economy. You have to turn around the job situation. You have to install and, and re-establish the degree of trust between the private sector and government, which has been eroded. And the only person who's able to do that in the short term it may have longer term adverse consequences, mm. sure. But in the short term, Ramaphosa, they believe, is the only person who can do so. So that's the second reason why. The third is, of course, what he says in the environment of corruption and state capture and accusations of it, uh, that it sounds much more uh, an approach to clean government, an approach to actually giving content to the idea of the developmental state. Whether he does so or not, it's a separate question. Yeah. But that's the kind of things he's saying. And that's what I think excites people. The Zuma aspect. Uh, how, how would you interpret it? There are those who say that, look, if you look at the last 12 to 18 months, it's been one setback after the other, definitely in the courts. I mean, that, that goes without saying, but uh, he, at, at different levels, he didn't get what he wanted, even within the ANC. But then there are others who say the mere fact that someone could survive all that he has survived in the last 18 months uh, tells you about uh, his political acumen and, and ability. He has, and, and, and there's no doubt that that's the case. And in the last two days, even though there have been many setbacks in court, he's managed to climb back a little. So originally, if you think about the fallout in KwaZulu-Natal, about contesting its, its 2015 conference, remember originally the NEC last week said, we're not certain whether the KZN should appeal that, uh, finding that it's null and void. Mm. They then let it slide for a week all the while, the KZN Void Provincial Executive Congress put in its application for appeal to the courts. And the NEC of the ANC was still not decided. But yesterday, just 24 hours ago, Zuma managed to sit with members of the ANC, NEC and the PEC and get the NEC to agree that KZN and PEC should appeal this. So that's the first mm. climb back. The second is on the question of the Eastern Cape. He's trying to get the two different sides to speak to each other. Now, this is clearly because of his political survival, but it, it is testament to his ability to play the rules and the processes in the ANC and put them, uh, this is what he's historically done. If, if the rules in the ANC don't work for you, you lose the, the rules in the state. In this time, the rules of the state are not available to him. They were available to him when it comes to Sasa, the grand scandal. Mm. They were available to him when it comes to Nkandla. Uh, they were available to him when it when it when it when it came to the it comes to the accusations of of corruption and state capture. He can use public law and rules and common law and and rules and procedures of the state to shield himself, while also using rules of the ANC. This time he's only left with the rules of the ANC, so he's got to play a smart political game. But that is exactly what he's done. He's got the ANC. NEC to agree that the PEC and KZN should appeal. Now, whether he's going to have more successes or not, I don't know. Uh, but I think his one limiting factor now is this, that unless they are able to change the rule which says that the president of the ANC is the candidate president come national public elections in 2019, he is not going to be eligible for a term again, right? So he won't be elected at the end of this year in the ANC. And that, of course, leaves him vulnerable to being recalled early, as was the case with mm -hmm. Thabo Mbeki. And I think all the different sides who are contesting this have more or less got consensus that they might be able to pull uh, a recall earlier than the end of his, his formal term in 2019. So that's his vulnerability only. But that's, I think, his only vulnerability. And lastly, Brian, before we, we let you go, how much under pressure will the ANC be come 2019's uh, national elections, irrespective of what happens in December? They are under immense pressure because, because look, even if you elect what, what people might consider the right or the correct leadership in 2017, in, at the end of 2017, you have a very short period in which you can clean up. 
you have a very short period in which you are able to turn things around and mount a coherent campaign because the level of mistrust and distrust and lack of confidence is now slowly beginning to take root. It was expressed in 2016 in the local government elections. The only hope for the ANC in that regard is that you know their, their, their traditional voters just didn't turn out to vote. They didn't necessarily always support another party. A small portion did. But it's a very scary indicator that even that small portion who did, that portion might get bigger and bigger. And if in a national election where you have a pure proportional representation system, if your voters don't turn out, the mathematical advantage to your opposition is quite high because in a proportionate system, you know, if you stay mm. away, you're pushing up their, their, their proportion, not their support, but proportion. their proportion. But when you translate proportion into seats, you're giving power. So, so I, I think it's a real worry. And there are two scenarios. If they elect the wrong leadership, then they're looking at settling only at 45 to 46 percent, and they will be forced to ensure a coalition, to, to enter into a coalition with someone or the other. If they elect the right leadership, they will end up with a comfortable majority, but nowhere near the 60 percent, you know, perhaps in the mid 50s or so. Mm. Of course, miraculously, you know, who knows? It, they might do better. But the idea for me is not how well or badly you do. The idea for me is whether you have a coalition government or whether you are governing on your own. What, coherent, what coherence can you strike? What stability can you bring back in a context of such declining levels of trust and such internal instability, which is spilling over more and more into the state? And thirdly, the risk of the split. If the split happens well and good, so it should happen. Because the thing about the split is that if it does happen, at least you'll preserve the legacy of the ANC. At the moment, I think the way things are going, and if it's not arrested, you will rubbish both what the ANC is doing currently, but you will also rubbish all the things the ANC has done historically. So with the current rubbishing will go its historical legacy. Some people even argue that perhaps to preserve just the historical legacy, it's better that they go their separate ways now mm. uh, rather than later. Prime, as always, Jazakumullah for the insightful perspective and for giving us your time. We really appreciate it. Shukran Jazakumullah for having me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's time for a break. Welcome back. So, yeah, that was quite uh, an in depth uh, analysis from Ibrahim Fakir. And mashallah, within the Muslim community, we've got such talent. Uh, Hafiz Ibrahim Fakir, I've mentioned this before, many may not know that uh, he's, he's a Hafiz, uh, originally from uh, Lanasia and uh, residing now uh, more towards uh, the, the northern suburbs, as uh, they say these days, but uh, very insightful and, and yeah, it's, it's relevant, you know, sometimes people say, hey, sometimes people tell me this, Mona, you know, man, this politics, we're tired of it. Uh, I can understand that. We also get tired of it sometimes. Uh, sometimes I, I go through a particular period where I just switch off from it. I don't read about politics and I don't follow. But uh, you can't do it for too long because uh, doing the kind of work that I do, you've got to be pretty much plugged in. But sometimes you need a bit of a breather from it. You just need to, uh, to be unplugged for a while. But uh, it, it's relevant whether you support the ANC or you don't. Anyway, let's continue now to some of the other segments. We move on to our Hadith segment for this evening. Two weeks ago, we commenced a discussion on, on, on sabr, and that is patience, right? And um, last week we discussed one hadith from, from Muslim, wherein Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, At-tuhuru shatrul iman, that purity is half of faith. And we spoke about external purity as well as internal purity and how both are important. And to emphasize the one, we shouldn't in any way try and trivialize the other. Walhamdulillahi tamla ul mizan, wa subhanallahi walhamdulillahi tamla an, aw tamla uma bayna samawati wal ard. We spoke about the phrases, uh, subhanallah and alhamdulillah, how it fills up the scales and, it, and it, it results in excessive reward that if you were to, for example, try and compare, then it would be like the, the, the expanse between the heavens and the earth. Then, was salah to nurun, that uh, salah is, is light and, and we explained what is the meaning of salah being light, that on the day of qiyamah when there will be darkness, it will illuminate the path for the person who was regular on his salah or it will appear uh, as a light on, on the face of the person, or it, 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 it fortifies you in this world, so it, it grants you that kind of light. It, it leads the way towards righteousness in this world. It lights up the path towards righteousness. Was to Burhan, and that charity is, uh, is a proof, meaning it testifies to the fact that you have faith, uh, that you have fulfilled the rights of your wealth. 
And then uh, relevant to, to our topic was sabr al diya that um, patience is light, patience is illumination. And we said that it either means the person who has patience will be rightly guided or the person who has patience, um, he will eliminate darkness. The patience will eliminate uh, darkness and, and, and difficulties. And will Qur'an hujjatun lak aw alayk? The Qur'an will either testify for you or against you, depending on whether you lived your life in accordance with the teachings of the Qur'an or not. And كل الناس يغضو فباعئ نفسه فمعتقها ومبقها That every person departs in the morning and then either sells his soul by freeing it from punishment or, or destroying it. You have this option every day for, for, for you to make or break your akhirah, so to speak, and it depends on how you do it. So that's the hadith that we, we discussed last week. The hadith that I want to discuss uh, this week, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I'll just run you through the translation and then we'll unpack it um, further after the break. An Abi Sa'idin Sa'ad ibn Malik, uh, Malik ibn Sinan al Khudri radiyallahu an, anna nasam min al Ansar, sa'alu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa'atahum. Thumma sa'aluhu fa'atahum, hatta nafida ma inda. Fa'ala lahum hina anfaka kulla shayin bi yedi. Ma yakun indi min khayrin falan addakhirahu ankum. Wa may yistafif yu ifahullah, wa may yistagni yuhnihillah, wa may yeta sabbar yu sabbirhullah, wa ma uati ahadun ata an khayran wa osa min al sabr. Mutafakun alim. Abu Sayyid Khudri radiyallahu an narrates that some people from the Ansar, a group of them, came to the Messenger of Allah and they asked for some assistance. So the Messenger of Allah gave him them. Then they came again and he gave them and they, came, they continued coming until he gave whatever he had. It was now depleted. And then the Prophet sallallahu told them, I will never withhold from you as long as I have. I will never withhold from you as long as I have. However, Allah gives chastity to the one who seeks it Allah gives independence to the one who seeks it and Allah gives patience to the one who exercises patience. No person has been given a gift that is better and greater than that of patience. After the break, I'll explain it further inshallah. All right, welcome back. So we translated the hadith just before the break and the Messiah emphasizes three things here. The first is chastity. The more you make yourself chaste, the more Allah will bless you with chastity. The other is independence. The more you endeavor to be independent, it doesn't mean that you have to become affluent or wealthy to be independent. The more you keep yourself independent, you refrain from begging, you refrain from leaning on people unnecessarily, the more Allah will bless you and Allah will make you independent, even though you don't become rich necessarily. And then the third part, which is relevant to our discussion, وَمَن يَتَصَبَّرْ يُسَبِّرْهُ اللَّهِ That um, Allah gives patience to the one who exercises patience. Meaning that the more you exercise patience, the more Allah endows you with that quality. And no one has been granted a gift that is better and greater than that of patience. So the more you will be patient, the more Allah will grant you patience. And the more you are blessed with patience, the more you can consider yourself very blessed. Because there isn't a better gift uh, or bounty of Allah wa ta'ala than you can be, that you can be granted than, than that of patience. I want to once again just remind you that patience is the English word that we use. But sabr, like we discussed two weeks ago, it doesn't only refer to patience in the face of difficulty. It refers also to being steadfast on what is right and, and, and fulfilling the commands of Allah. Being steadfast in abstaining from that which is wrong, persevering. So patience, steadfastness and perseverance. Maybe those three words together we could say uh, to some extent or to a large extent encapsulate the meaning of the word sabr. The key question is, or the key point is this rather, that we need to internalize this. You know, discussions are many as I always say, and we need to introspect and say to what extent do I find patience and to what extent do I find sabr in my life in terms of patience in the face of difficulty, perseverance, as well as steadfastness. And how can I improve? And how do I motivate myself? Uh, this hadith can be used as a motivating factor that the more I will, I will uh, improve with regards to sabr in my life, the more Allah will bless me with sabr. May Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala grant us uh, the understanding and may Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala bless us. It was uh, beautiful to be in your company uh, this evening, live from our studios here in Sunning Hill, Johannesburg. People of Cape Town, Mensa Fun Cup start, uh, will be in Cape Town next week, inshallah. Uh, Juma in Muir Street. And then uh, speaking also at the Fajr al-Islam 
um, Jalsa at uh, Islamia College on, on Saturday. So it will be nice to, to uh, meet the viewers of uh, ITV in Cape Town next weekend, inshallah. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.